My name is Tracy Ireland and I'm the director of the Centre for Creative and Cultural Research at the University of Canberra. My first duty, of course, as always, is to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on here in Canberra today, the Ngunnawal people. And they're the traditional owners um, of, of this area and make such an enormous uh, contribution to the ongoing cultural life of our community. I want to pay my respects to their elders, elders past, present and emerging. And also extend that respect uh, to the elders of the lands upon, uh, of all the areas that our online audience is joining us from. So today we have about 40 people here in the, in the theatre of the Shine Dome, the Ian Walk Theatre, and we have about 70 people joining us online. So fingers crossed for me that all the technology works. It could be a Christmas miracle. So. Now, before I introduce our first speakers, I, I need to go through some housekeeping for both the online and the in-person um, audience. So in case of an emergency, uh, please exit through the door in, uh, that you came in from, the door facing the ANU. Um, and please be careful um, of the activity outside uh, and don't climb over the scaffolding or do anything that you know that you shouldn't. We ask you all to please follow any instructions from staff regarding COVID um, regulations, um, and they're beautifully organised here at the Shine Dome, so I think you've all been uh, well looked after in that regard. And please, if you haven't already checked in using the Canberra app, please do, do so. Now, one of the um, important things to mention is that because of COVID regulations, we won't be passing around a microphone for questions. Um, so all questions today are going to be um, emailed through to me. Um, so the email address is there on the screen, events at science.org.au. So please do um, send those questions through and it'll be my job as moderator to um, uh, pass them on to the panel at the end of the proceedings. Now, we're delighted um, to now ask to the stage, um, firstly, Anna Maria Arabia, the CEO of the Australian Academy of Science. Thank you, Tracy, and welcome everyone to the um, beautiful Shine Dome, which is undergoing something of a rebirth at the moment for our online audience. Uh, the copper roof of the dome, which covers its entire surface, is uh, receiving a new layer of copper. So there is an emerging shine coming from the moat to the apex of the dome. It is rather spectacular if you have a chance to visit in Canberra. Um, this is, of course, the home of the Australian Academy of Science, and we acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners um, on the land on which this Shine Dome and the Academy of Science offices are built here in Canberra. And indeed, we'd like to acknowledge all the traditional owners where the Academy of Science operates and where its fellows live and work. Uh, the Australian Academy of Science, as you know, brings together about 550 of Australia's most distinguished scientists. They're elected by their peers um, based on their extraordinary record in science. Um, and they co contribute their intellect, time, energy and enthusiasm to advance uh, science in Australia and to support scientists in Australia. And at the Academy of Science, it's my great privilege to be able to work with them and with the staff of the Academy to do that in many ways, to provide scientific evidence to decision makers to help inform their decisions, uh, to assist in the delivery and development of science education for schools and teachers, uh, to assist those scientists who um, have more challenges, early and mid-career researchers, women, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and others, um, and in ensure that they're given every opportunity to advance science and scientists in Australia as well, and a number of other activities which we're very proud of. Um, this is, of course, the first symposium um, of the Sustainable Shine Dome project, which is focused on developing an innovative sustainability plan for net zero emissions future 
for this wonderful National Heritage listed place. Uh, the building has and does carry the voice of scientists who have dedicated their life to inquiry, many of them um, to sustainability science in particular, but all of them with an interest in sustainability. Um, so it's absolutely fitting that the building itself and this very project um, has every chance to speak its values and speak the values of those who are convened within it. Um, I'd like to thank our partners, the University of Canberra, GML Heritage and GHD Engineering. Um, uh, together, this project is um, being undertaken and it's a very exciting one. We're very, very happy to be involved in it. I'd also like to thank today's speakers. We've got a terrific lineup, And of course, you, the audience, to the people who are here in the Shine Dome. For me, it's wonderful to have people in real life um, in the Shine Dome. I hope 2021's most used acronym is IRL in real life. Um, and of course to our online audience it is wonderful to host you as well because of course COVID has taught us that uh, taking things online means we can reach um, people beyond our borders and it's and it's wonderful uh, so I very much look forward to the outcomes of this partnership and hand you back to Tracy thank you thanks so much Anna Maria so as Anna Maria said, this is the first uh, symposium in a series of three um, for the Sustainable Shine Dome project. Um, and this project is funded through the Australian government, Australia Heritage Grants Program of the Australian government. Um, and as Anna Maria uh, mentioned, it's a partnership between the Academy of Science, GHD, GML Heritage, and the University of Canberra. And now I'd like to welcome uh, to the stage Professor Lee Sullivan, who is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research and Innovation at the University of Canberra. Uh, thank, thank you, Tracy. I'm delighted to join Anna Maria Arabia in welcoming everyone online and also those in, in place here at the beautiful Shine Dome um, to this first symposium on the Sustainable Shine Dome, Shine Dome project. Uh, this is an opportunity for the University of Canberra to partner with the Academy of Science as well as industry leaders, GML Heritage and GHD Engineering, to develop an innovative sustainability plan uh, for net uh, zero emissions future for the National Heritage Listed Shine Dome. It's exactly the type of applied mission oriented research that our university excels in and where we pride ourselves in terms of working together with partners in solving the pressing problems that we face as a community. The Centre for uh, Creative and Cultural Research, of which Tracy is a director, and the Faculty of Arts and Design, uh, where the lead investigators for this uh, project are based, holds a diverse portfolio of um, inter-, inter and multidisciplinary research projects that combine humanities and creative approaches with the sciences, engineering and health disciplines to develop innovative responses to improving wellbeing and produce social and cultural outcomes of great importance to us as a society. Other examples of these approaches include our current ARC funded project, looking also at the future conservation of another well-known icon, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. We're also working with Defence on an arts project that's had, had outstanding results in working with those who have suffered trauma, uh, trauma using creative practice such as photography, music, creative writing and poetry to tell their own stories and uh, to contribute to improving health and wellbeing, both of people that have been involved in defence and also the families and others that have been impacted uh, by traumas that arise out of those activities. Some of you may also be aware of the Hag Park experiments here in Canberra last year, which won a Planning and Institute Australia Award for Excellence in Public Engagement and Community Planning. And that was for its work in using art to play and uh, transform a, a perceived unsafe space within Canberra into a treasured, fun community asset. This kind of innovative research has contributed to UC's rapid rise in the global rankings. We're now, according to Times Higher Education, the top 10 in Australia, the fastest rising university in the upper echelons of those rankings. 
But look, clearly more, far more important than the rankings is our ability to do research that contributes to public good and makes public con uh, positive contributions to our community. So I wish you well for this symposium and for this uh, uh, project and particularly I'd like to thank Susan MacDonald from the Getty Conservation Institute in LA and Dr. Carolyn Noller of the Footprint Company for generously joining uh, us today to share the benefits of their expertise with their team and with this audience. And I look forward to more of the outcomes of this really innovative and exciting project. Thank you. Great, thank you everyone for those um, lovely introductions. So I think we're going to start with our first um, panel of speakers. Um, and these are speakers who are researchers on the Sustainable Shine Dome um, project. I'm not going to do detailed um, uh, introductions of everybody's um, biographies um, because we have a tight time frame. But our first speaker is Professor Michael Jackson, uh, Jasper. I was going to call you Michael Jackson then. Um, he is fairly cool. Um, the Professor of Architecture at the University of Canberra. Um, and he will give us an introduction to the Sustainable Shine Dome project. Great. Um, thank you, Tracy. And um, good afternoon. In my brief comments, as Tracy alluded to, I'll provide an overview of the Australian Heritage Grant Program including reference to Australian Heritage List places. Following a description of national heritage place values ascribed to the Australian Academy of Science building, I'll discuss the major propositions underlying our project, the team's approach, and provide an overview of key activities across the project's roughly 12-month duration. I'll conclude with some observations on intended project outcomes. As has been noted, uh, the Sustainable Shine Dome project has been made possible by funds awarded under the Australian government's Australian Heritage Grants 2019-20 program. The Australian Heritage Grants program provides support to protect and promote the listed values of national heritage list places through strengthened recognition, management, conservation, and public engagement. A key objective of the program is to conserve, protect, and sustainably manage Australia's heritage. And the team was specifically intrigued by this charge, nay, the challenge, of sustainably managing this place in all its complexities. The grant program's intended outcomes include improved recognition, conservation, and preservation of national heritage list place values, access to national heritage listed places and enriched appreciation of the values of listed national heritage places through improved community engagement. To give a further sense of the context of our work, the 2017 report, uh, The Story So Far, describes over 100 places on the national heritage list. These places are of outstanding heritage value to the nation for their natural indigenous and historic values. And to give a sense of the sweep, the list includes such places as diverse as Willandra Lakes, New South Wales, for its natural values, Ubir in Kakadu Park for its indigenous values, and of course Bondi Beach for its historic value. The Australian Academy of Science building, now known as the Shine Dome, was added to the National Heritage List in 2005. At the time of its citation, a number of national heritage place values were ascribed to the Shine Dome. A rare example of the use of a freestanding dome form. A purest academic representation of geometric structuralism. The listing continues, the building demonstrates clarity of design philosophy in the uncompromising, integrated, and consistent architectural style and detailing of the building's exterior and interior. The citation continues, the national heritage importance of the Academy of Science as expressed in the building with its interior design furnishings and finishes and the encircling water-filled moat. 
The citation continues that the design of the Academy of Science building demonstrates a high level of creativity both in its concept and a high level of integrity in the execution of that concept. And perhaps most compelling for this project, the listing references that the creation of the Academy and the Australian Academy of Science building is directly related to scientists who are instrumental in the establishment of the Academy and as has been noted by Anna Maria, its ongoing mission. And here, to take one example, a prescient event some three decades ago, to almost to the day, on a topic that of climate change and biodiversity crisis, occupying us even more urgently today and brought to national and international attention due in part to the Academy and this place. Such activities are now more urgent than ever. There are two propositions or hypotheses underlying our work. Uh, the first proposition, consistent with place values as representing Academy of Science's national urge to innovate, we conjecture that a sustainability plan that researches and recommends adoption of world-leading strategies and innovative approaches will ensure the project contributes to protect and sustainably manage over time the place's national heritage values. We also conjecture that the project will ensure the scientific energy and experimentation, not only on the team, but in its fellows, and associated with the Academy of Science and the listed place will continue to res resonate for decades to come. In order to approach these propositions, a tried and tested methodology of overlapping phases has been adopted. In the first phase, just concluded, the project team has analyzed current conditions. In a second phase, just starting, we'll develop and model sustainable future scenarios to imagine what can, at the most radical edge of sustainability, can occur. And in a final phase, we'll develop, as others have alluded to, a sustainability plan and, importantly, an approach to its implementation over time. Underlying all phases is a continuous series of promotion activities, of which this afternoon is just one such event. And here's our timeline showing the project running through mid-2021. The project will result in a number of outcomes. Uh, the first, as has been alluded to, a sustainability plan, one that will provide a degree of certainty to the Academy in coming decades to ensure capital expenditure progressively protects heritage values. Second, and probably of potentially most use, methodological innovations. Uh, theorizing and modeling the impacts of sustainable heritage principles and practices may provide lessons for environmental and cultural heritage, heritage sustainability applicable to other Australian national heritage places. Finally, and consistent with Australian Heritage Grant's objectives, the non-quantifiable non benefits should also be noted. To that end, enriching community awareness of Australia's scientific urge to innovate with an express emphasis on scientific energy and experimentation associated with the Academy since its foundation will ensure the Shine Dome continues to serve as a symbol and place to galvanize coming generations of Australian scientists and the role of scientific knowledge. I hope you'll continue to engage in the project over coming months and add to the conversation. Thank you. Beautifully timed. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> so I should have said at the beginning that we have um, three short presentations from project team members, followed by a slightly longer um, presentation by um, our special guest speaker, Dr. Carolyn Noller, um, the founder and CEO of the Footprint Company. Then we'll take a, a really short break uh, just to uh, have a stretch, and then we'll come back with some case studies. Our next speaker is Ty Hollingsby, the National Building Engineer Leader of GHD. And uh, Ty is going to join us um, online from Melbourne. That's not him. <laughs> That's him. <laughs> Hello. All right, just checking um, tonight to say that you can hear me and we've got our slides up and going. Sounds good. Yes, all good. 
Great. Okay, we're ready to go. On to the next slide. Yep, that's me. Good afternoon, all. Um, beaming in from Victoria, and uh, we, we all hope we're, we're doing well. If you could go to the next slide, please. So the intent um, in the next eight minutes or so is to give you an overview of uh, the activities we've done from a sort of more detailed analysis, analytical perspective. Uh, talk about some of the opportunities the project team sees uh, as we you know, embark on this pathway to uh, zero emissions. And then also to highlight um, some of the, the, the next steps that we'll take uh, on this project. Next slide, please. So a bit of context, um, next slide, please, is we're obviously in, in Canberra, and um, if you just click on, you can just see the, the sun move around, move, move around a little bit. We're, we're, we're in um, a climate, climate zone, uh, zone seven, and you know, that's, that's a temp, temperate profile. So four distinct seasons, um, the summer can be, can be quite, quite, quite hot, uh, and the winter can be quite cold. That, that level of, sort of uh, analytical um, work and, and data, if you s slip onto the next slide, please, is important because we need to understand how the building functions relative to its external environments. And we make use of computational tools and computational modeling uh, packages to help us quantify performance in the building. Um, that then also enables us to test ideas uh, and test different strategies so that we can uh, move towards a, a rational and pragmatic understanding of some of these things that we'd be looking at and quantify them in terms of impact on reducing carbon, impact on the reduction of uh, energy use, and, and also the important factor around how much you know, what are the operational costs associated with some of these um, strategies that we may be looking at in, in, the, in the very near future. Next slide, please. So we wanted to uh, highlight, I suppose, some aspects of the existing building that make it both uh, difficult to, to work in, but also opportunities. Next slide. And if we consider the building envelope, and that building envelope is about the skin that wraps around the space in which you're inhabiting. Um, you know, the roof is, is a critical and beautiful part of this project. It's actually also one of the weakest points because we're unable to do very much physical change to it because of its value in terms of its heritage. Uh, and there's also limited amount of insulation in that roof. So that's an opportunity there for us to look at how, how innovative we can be and how smart can we be to improve the performance of that roof and thereby improve, you know, uh, all the energy costs associated with cooling the building and heating the building. Next slide, please. Within inside the building's um, fabric, so you know internal walls, there's 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 a number of different uh, ceiling finishes and, and wall finishes and how they connect together with between the walls, the glass, and the roof. Um, this was a, a building that was built quite a long time ago, and uh, as a result, lots of gaps. Those gaps mean um, energy is escaping through these gaps, uh, and that that will eventually translates into overall energy consumption and, and how we can. Uh, work with that and, and plug those gaps is, is, is actually quite a big task uh, that we're working through in the next next few phases. Next slide, please. Then when you consider well, what are the systems that enable the building to run, uh, air conditioning systems, uh, pump systems to move water around, um, all of those elements consume significant uh, amounts of energy. So when we're looking at an existing and an old building, there's, there are steps that we need to uh, consider to make sure that if we're upgrading equipment, is it the best piece of equipment for, for, for the context of where we're trying to get to? And also, um, uh, how can we make best use of what's there without having to replace uh, existing materials and existing systems with new materials that uh, contribute to the overall carbon story? The next slide, please. Probably goes without saying that, you know, in terms of hydraulic systems, so water, fit, water fixtures and, and capturing rainwater, um, that is all from another era. So there's a, there's a big piece of work that we could consider here in terms of upgrading all of those facilities because the amount of water that we consume also um, is participates in, in part of the uh, uh, carbon emission story. The next slide, please. Lighting and power is, is perhaps the more obvious uh, to, to, to everyone around opportunities. Uh, you're uh, doing little interventions over hundreds and hundreds of light fittings uh, aggregates into a big positive outcome. So huge reductions of energy consumption, and we'll talk talk some numbers shortly. Um, some of this work is is you know pretty much business as usual for for most of the industry. And the, the the challenge that we have here is how do we do this in the context of a beautiful heritage listed building and making sure that we're getting the most out of uh, energy reduction, but without damaging um, you know the the legacy that's there within the fabric of the building. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, the current building performance, we, we've done some work just to understand where we are, so to establish some baselines. The next slide, please. 
And the um, electric electricity and gas use, you know, this is a, an interesting looking graph that, that shows us um, you know, the profile of gas consumption and profile of electric electricity use over a, a certain amount of period. And those who know the grass, understand grass a bit, you'll see gas dips when it's hot uh, and then gas consumption uh, increases when it's, when it's winter. Um, this amount of information helps us understand how the building is running. Next slide, please. And if we consider that also with some other aspects of resource consumption, like water, for example, and how much water the building uses, the next slide, please. Uh, it helps us paint a picture of, well, where, where is the baseline carbon emissions for the entire facility? And this is just the start of some of the detailed work that the team is getting into. And if you go to the next slide, please, um, we, we start to paint a story around, uh, well, what, are, what, are, what is the profile for this building? What are the emissions like over, over the period? Uh, and then what, what can we do? What are the biggest parts of this pie that we can tackle? And you'll see that from January 2020 um, onwards, there's a, there's a dip to almost zero, and that's because the building has been shut down. Now, one would argue that's, that's, you know, that's one approach to getting to zero emissions, don't open the building. Um, but, but, it, but it actually points to the, the, the significant impact that all these systems running have on a building like this. Next slide. And so just to highlight a couple of points here, um, you know, part of the t activity that we do as engineers, as architects, is to understand uh, at a mathematical level where the energy is consumed. And we use computational tools that help us model all the bits that are inside the building in the context of the uh, Canberra uh, climate. And we calibrate that against the data that we have and it, and it pumps out information like this. So some of the information here that, that that's in line with what we're expecting is that nearly, nearly half of the electricity use is coming from lighting. So that's a very big, low-hanging fruit that we can tackle quite quickly and reduce that significantly. And then the rest of the electricity consumption is, relates to making sure that we're comfortable inside, that, that, inside these spaces. Next slide, please. And part of, that, part of that story is understanding when it happens. So in peak winter conditions, where are we losing and gaining energy and, and likewise in the summer. And you know, one interesting thing about this is that the, the massive concrete slab that you're sitting upon is a, is a great benefit to, to the building. You know, it, it stores energy during uh, when it needs to, so it maintains its, uh, its, its cooling conditions, or it's cool in, in old language. Uh, and then we can make use of that uh, beneficially in the summer conditions. So it helps reduce energy consumption by, not, by controlling the, 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 the way in which the building modulates its internal temperature. The next slide, please. And as I come, come to the end of what, we, what, uh, what I'm showing with you here, you know, the journey that we're on is, 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 is moving towards this net, net zero concept, which we'll t tackle and, and discuss and debate today. Next slide, bit. I just really wanted to highlight that, you know, part of that journey, and we're right on the left-hand side of the, of the slide at the moment, we're establishing where we are now, and we're identifying where, you know, where the opportunities are to reduce carbon in, in, within the facility. And as we move through the project, we'll be looking at how do we remove fossil fuels from the site? How do we connect into a 100% uh, renewable energy source in terms of the grid? And then looking at, well, what are the, what are the leftovers and, and how, how do we need to tackle that? And offsetting is one of a number of options that, that the project team can consider. But this is part of the journey that we're on. None of these are, are, are uh, just, just defined or decided on yet. And just to go to the last slide here then, um, Part of this process and the next steps that, that will uh, evolve here is, you know, how do we how do we account for this? How do we certify or, or, or um, uh, make some account, provide some accountability about how we're achieving this and whether or not we're achieving this? And so there are, you know, there are systems and there are certification methods that we can explore, uh, and that's what one of the key that we're doing it in the next phase of this work. So there's just a, a two more slides. I guess I'll end on the next slide um, and the next one. Yep. So. Um, so our next remaining steps for us then is um, one, we're going to be workshopping with, you know, out of the output from today, what are the overarching sustainability strategies that we can incorporate into the, into the plan for, for this project? Um, there's a collection of detailed calculations that we want to get into based on the information that we have to quantify how, how building really performs and, and, and therefore where, where the opportunities are for to, to capture uh, carbon emission strategies. Um, and then there's, there's also some physical things that we would like to investigate. One is around potentially understanding how leaky this building is, you know, quantifying that in terms of numbers, uh, and then making some internal measurements to qualify the building performance around you know, temperatures, uh, uh, how much air is being moved around by the system, um, and, and also some pretty low hanging fruit around, you know, sub the, the system so that we can, you know, close down or, or tune down where there's a lot of energy consumption uh, taken apart. Next slide. And so um, that concludes my eight minutes. Uh, thank you for 
for, for listening and look forward to some discussion later on. Thank you, Kai. That worked perfectly. It looked great, great. here in, in, uh, in the theatre, yes, with your sort of avatar uh, on the little screen in front of us. So um, please remember to um, uh, email your questions through to, sci to events at science.org.au. Um, and the final uh, of our short presentations in this section is Professor Hans Bachel, AM and a Fellow of the Academy and Secretary of Education and Public Awareness um, of the Australian Academy of Science. Thanks, Hans. Thank you and good afternoon here and good afternoon online. Where's the camera actually? Yes, over there. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm one of the fellows uh, that Anna Maria mentioned, one of the a bit over 500 scientists. So my background is physics and lasers and optics, and I can give you a half an hour lecture about that. But instead of that, uh -huh, the green one is forward. I think that's good thinking. Um, I would like to focus on the people, the people that made this building and the people who use the building and what we want to do with it. So. Let me send you back to the 1950s. By the way, does anybody of you know who was the first PhD student awarded in Australia and roughly when? Any volunteer? Anna Maria knows. 1948. A lady in something like virus hemoglobin at Melbourne University. So before that, actually, Australia didn't have PhD students because the tradition was to go overseas to do a PhD. And that was it. So we're talking about a time where on the left-hand side you see Canberra and you see where the uh, academy would be in that round part. And the only thing that exists was the building of anatomy, which is over there, now film archives. National Film Archive, Beauchamp House, which is now our residence for the Academy, called Ian Potter House, and a big uh, sort of roundish piece of land there. And then I said, A new, because it didn't exist. Not that part. Some other parts were coming along. The first president of the Academy was Mark Oliphant. Nuclear physics came from the UK and then from US, and you think about you know, nuclear bombs, rockets, and all of that. Uh, the second president is John Eccles, and they, he was working in neuroscience and showing that what happens in our head is actually linked to electric signals. And I find it interesting then when Mark Oliphant, then president of the Academy, talked to Nugget Coombs. Now, he was vice chancellor at the time. He was governor of the Reserve Band, one of the influential people in Canberra. And he pointed out that what was really needed in Canberra was a building to hold symposia for which there was no style of seating, adequate seating in Canberra or probably anywhere. And so he thought about what you're doing right now. A beautiful room, sitting in it, listening to a symposia, having questions and answers. And he noted there was a growing tendency for seminars and conference in Canberra, and we believe that it would provide a national service. So these people were thinking big. And what I find interesting is that in a way, the building is designed from the inside out, from the purpose of having this beautiful meeting room, and then what you do with the rest which is quite different to, let's say, the buildings of the Royal Society, that is the uh, academy on which this one was built in terms of its regulations and ideas, and they were members of the Royal Society. Those buildings were clearly built from the outside in. And now they're beautiful inside as well, but, you know, it was a different type of architecture. Um, it was a visionary time, the 1950s. Here is a sketch what is the meeting room should look like that we're going to join later on now, yes, called the Jäger Room. Um, and to me, that resembles a club. It's sort of the modern version of a London club, isn't it? 
with lounge chairs. Now, if you sit on your bench, in the middle there's a round thing sort of ahead of you that actually covers up where the ashtrays used to be. And that was a feature of, of life in those days. So there was smoking in the lecture theater, which would make it bad for the projectionist. They were all men. Actually, coming back to the first PhD, interesting to note that the majority of the PhDs in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s were women, if you count all subjects. Not in science, but in all subjects. They caught up in about 1990 to 50% female and men. And so, yes, the women had a lead. But they were not the scientists at the time. Um, the scientists were pretty practical. Mark Oliphant was more an engineer and also John Eccles. And as I say on the slide, I think what he thought about national importance, that Canberra was emerging as the place where the big decisions are made. So that's where you met, and that's where having a meeting room would be a key advantage to make the link to decision makers. And just for Thai, um, you know, one of the solutions we're going to implement is heat pumps. Actually, Mark Oliphant, when he saw the copper dome, in his mind immediately said, heat exchanger. I'm going to use this to get the warmth out into a system. And he started designing one, which fortunately was never built. Because if you're working in the ANU, you know what a white elephant is. <laughs> it's a machine that has 40 years lifetime and never really came up to spec. And so I think by doing heat pumps in 2020, we're actually recreating Mark Oliphant, but with the appropriate technology. So flipping forward from the 50s to now, uh, here's a photo of what we use the Shine Dome for. The event is called Falling Walls Lab. The event is a national competition for young postdocs and PhD young researchers. Um, to present an idea, first to say what wall they want to crash, second, what idea it is, and maybe even convince you that it can be done, and you got three minutes to do it. So it's three minutes talks a little bit uh, more advanced. And here we see the finalist in 2019, and you see the atmosphere and the dome. So you see diversity. You see people coming from all parts of the country. And the three winners of this event, where we have a live jury here, are actually going, to, well, were gone to Berlin, went at the time to present Australia's idea in a global competition amongst a hundred other people. So that's the sort of way we're thinking about what does the Shine Dome do. National, young, diverse, international. Some snapshots from that event. So you see great diversity. You see intense discussion. You see mixing of experience with new ideas. Yeah, Alan Finkel is getting right into it there as a judge. And you know, so there's an intense discussion of what's going on here. Now that was in the past distance, the last decade, 2019. As you know, the world has changed. So now we're talking about exactly what we're doing here online events, hybrid events, you being here and you being over wherever. Could be national, could be international. We're sort of in a bit of a testing period. It works brilliantly already and we'll smooth it even more. And that, will, I think, will be the future. So we will be visible to a much wider world. So when we think sustainability, I like to think at least another 60 years for the building. Why not 100? Um, and we have to take into account in our design the people. This was built by visionaries in the 50s, and we're very grateful for that. This is now being used by a very diverse group, a very dynamic group, and what you see on the last picture there on the bottom right is the back room. These are the people all hidden here who make it possible to have hybrid events, checking the email, giving the question to all these things, that is the future. So to the architects, how can we put all of that technology in here and it still looks as elegant and beautiful 
And the final question, are you asleep? <laughs> no, but if I talk a little bit more on those couches, you would fall asleep. So we're looking for a new solution that keeps the audience happy, alive, and not just leaning back. Thank you for your time. Yes, those couches are pretty comfy, aren't they? It's a, a long way up out of them. Thank you, Hans, for that lovely um, overview of the the idea that was the genesis of this building and how uh, the building is is a place that keeps that um, that idea um, alive and how that it's integrally linked. So thanks to the first three speakers who showed us some of the frames um, that need to be applied um, in this, this project. The frame of national heritage listing, the frame of the material and physical qualities um, of the building, and of course the frame of the culture and history um, that, that gives it uh, life and meaning. So next we're going to um, turn to uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Caroline Noller, who's going to give us um, a case study. And Caroline is the founder and CEO of The Footprint Company. And her talk's entitled Quantifying Embodying Energy in Historic Buildings. And the case study is the Sirius Building in Sydney. And remember to keep emailing in the questions. We'll have questions after Caroline. Thanks. Thank you very much, esteemed colleagues, and thank you so much for those introductions. It's put, uh, it's put hopefully my talk into a really nice context for um, your objectives here today. Uh, and I've got to say I'm super privileged and honoured to be here because I've loved this building ever since I was a little girl. Uh, and my father gifted me for Christmas the book, because I was an avid reader, The Bunyip That Ate Canberra. And uh, ever since then it's been one of my top buildings of the world. So today's talk, um, I'm going to do a couple of different things. Uh, I'm going to just first quickly take a step back, climate change and how do we relate it to the built environment and the challenge that we are faced with with the built environment uh, from here on in. And then introduce the quantification methodology of embodied carbon. What is it? How does it relate to buildings? How big is it? How much carbon have we got to worry about? And where is it in a building? And then this puts into context very much about the question of retention and reuse. And then obviously then I'll bring it all down together at the end with a serious uh, case study, which is really interesting because sort of just uh, seeing some of the challenges that you've got with this um, building, it certainly um, holds a lot of parallels to many of the investigations and studies that we did in terms of formulating the bid proposition for, this, for, for the site. Um, if we stand back and sort of uh, talk about climate change for a moment, we often see images, or I guess we all see images today, about you know power stations pumping out pollution, floods and fire. But I always feel that these don't really help us give us a tangible and visceral understanding of the proximity of this thing called climate change and atmospheric concentrations of CO2 to our day-to-day. -day. The picture that you see here is uh, from an app called the Windy app. If you haven't got it, it's fantastic. I use it for all sorts of things, fun things, surfing, skiing, but also uh, to remind myself about why we struggle sometimes to get uh, understanding about what we need to do to do a better job of protecting the planet. Uh, 18 months ago, to October 2019, I was giving a talk. I took this particular picture. What it is giving us is a visualisation of the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And when we uh, consider the Paris Climate Accord, the objective of that uh, accord is to try and maintain a global atmospheric concentration of CO2 less than 420 parts per billion. Uh, and it's probably very difficult to see, but in the bottom right-hand corner we have uh, a scale of concentration in parts per billion. And we can see there's a great divide between north and south, and then we can also see that there's an awful lot of the globe that's already sitting in its proximity of 400 or more, uh, and some areas, particularly our outsourced production to places like China and the US of industrial production, four to five times that. Um, and 
then I sort of thought in preparing for this talk, I thought, I wonder what it looks like today, for surely after a year of COVID, we might have a slightly different picture. Surely it's less because we haven't had everybody flying around and we haven't had the production. And I was sort of pretty shocked actually to see that not only does it not look less, it looks more. Uh, and then it came to my mind that when we think about our challenge over the next 10 years, and particularly the role of buildings, uh, and then governments of the world are seeing building as an escape from our COVID recessions, I wonder about actually the proximity of our challenge with uh, increasing production to get us out of an economic problem that may well continue to cause us an environmental problem. So let's just now come down our funnel. When we think about Paris and the Climate Accord, the 1.5 degrees that we hear about is literally about us taking a pathway from our peak emissions of 40 gigatons all the way down to uh, net zero by 2050, but that relies on us actually achieving a 65% reduction in intensity of all of our activities by 2030. So in 10 years from now, 65% less and everything that we do has, gives us some probability of maintaining our 1.5 degrees. If we only hit 50%, then we overshoot to two degrees Celsius. So that really is, in a nutshell, we need to be doing things today that put us on a track for a 65% reduction. So when we think about that 40 gigatons, and if we look at, well, who demands that? Who drives that through the, through the demand for the consumption of things and stuff? This pie chart shows the emissions, uh, the, the net emissions uh, to atmosphere each year, and it's now organised in a way that is actually looking at who is consuming, who is pushing it through consumption. And you can see that 55%, some estimates vary up to 60, arises from our demand for construction materials each year. And that, those construction materials go into our built environment, infrastructure and buildings each year. And then you can see the scope one and two, our operating carbon footprint in the two small slices up the top. So that puts into context the annualised issue as well as then this very big thing called embodied carbon. And so that's why over the last 12 months it's been mercifully recognised that all the electrification and solar looking at net zero operations is just not enough. So fortunately we've had uh, 12 months since we um, had a m number of big organisations, architects around the world, say embodied carbon is a thing. And I have to say it's great because for 20 years or so I've been doing embodied carbon and up until last year I was pretty lonely at dinner parties when I started. People would ask me, what do I do? Embodied carbon? Don't talk to that crazy lady. Now, mercifully, I have some dinner com conversation that I can engage in. So, when we look at half of the problem is associated with our building materials. When we think about how long it takes to get a building going, it's five years literally from the time somebody wants to invest in a building to the time it opens its doors. So today, all those projects that, that are on foot literally are sort of lost to us, if you like. So we've got uh, an urgent problem to try and achieve this 65% uh, reduction. And we have to remember that it's not just about making a reduction with what we have today. We're also having to deal with the fact that we're, double, we're doubling the population of building on the planet. Two billion square metres is what we already have as a global estimated building stock. And then another two billion, <laughs> two billion more required by 2060 to house and to accommodate the growth in population, urbanisation of humanity. And most of that, 60 odd percent of that is in the Southern Hemisphere and the developing nations. And so we have to look at the opportunity of how do we get them to start at 65% less. And then how do we look to that 2 billion square metres of existing building? And how do we retain and leverage every single square inch of that to not need to cut it down and rebuild it? And how can we use that to be part of the story of getting to the net zero that we need? By the way, 2 billion square metres by 2060 is the equivalent of building a new New York City every 40 days for the next 40 years. That's how much materials and building we need. 
So it's an incredible challenge and just mentally you just think, wow, we have to do something now. As I said, bringing all of that together, <clears throat> we've already got big calls for big cuts um, by a variety of uh, different authorities and groups around the world and in absence of national action on these things, these organisations, there's over 1,000 uh, architectural practices in the UK who have signed themselves to declare 976 in Australia. We deal with a lot of them, trying to enable them. And when we think about not only do we need to make that cut, but how do we enable an entire sector for this challenge? And I feel like this is a great topic for the Academy to consider as part of its policy and sustainability response is the speed at which we can retool and engage and enable our sectors to be able to respond to this challenge. So how much carbon are we talking about? This picture gives us a number of building typologies. Um, fortunately, in uh, my career of Embodied Carbon and the reason the Footprint Company and its uh, online software and information exists is because uh, I pioneered a lot of this work in Australia um, back in the early 2000s. Um, and we built software because all of a sudden within major development companies like Lend Lease, they wanted to do this as leaders in this space because it was a quantification method that all of a sudden put tangible, uh, tangible impacts to design to be able to respond. And uh, I mean, the building sector is a terribly competitive thing. So you put a number in front of an engineer or a builder, they can do better. So that's the power of enabling and quantifying carbon particularly for, for materials, is it gives us an ability to take informed decisions rapidly. So these uh, numbers are all in kilograms of CO2 per square metre of net floor area of these different types of buildings. And so the ratios of all those different buildings to each other, you can see. So premium office space has an, can have an incredibly high uh, footprint of um, nearly 10 tonnes of CO2 per square metre when we talk about all of the structure and all of the fit out. Um, the the coloured lines here uh, show um, the averages and then the red obviously is the worst and the green becomes better. And so these colour bands arise from our data where we have had examples of all these different projects and what's quite nice is that we've also got now some intelligence that we can then assist with uh, who we work with as to how to direct design decisions to get these particular solutions. So where is it though in the building becomes a really important next question. If we take the midpoint averages of each of those uh, building types and we look at the elements of those buildings, where is the carbon? This picture tells us that uh, we have structure is ST, so that's the superstructure, the foundations um, at columns. Facade is the envelope, the external walls, the external windows um, and roof. Internal finishes and walls is the grey. Services is yellow, and that is the combination of mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, vertical transportation. Um, and then external works, and most importantly, preliminaries in the act of building the building. So it actually is quite significant. And then fit out, and fit out uh, is shown there literally to give the proportion of it, because uh, whilst it can almost be, in a sense, its own element, it is still a massive part of um, the responsible net zero pathway. So it's certainly when we talk to a lot of the big REITs, it's not just about them building the, the most shiny five star or six star building, it's about making sure that they're engaging with their fit outs and their tenants about also lifting half the other side of the embodied carbon footprint. And if I think about this particular building, and we talk about well, how much carbon might be in this building. When we look at the cultural uh, uh, column there, that's sort of a representative type of building in the sort of uh, ilk of this building. So we're sort of talking something in the order of three and a half tonnes of CO2 per square metre for a product which is a, a concrete steel um, building with its, with its fit out. So if we then sort of start to consider then retention, reuse, because our structures, because our envelopes are typically designed life for 50 years or so, that life cycle also gives us that ability to actually say, you know what, when we want to adaptively reuse them, they actually still 
form a core component of the embodied carbon. So if we were looking at um, the potential for reuse, then we sort of would say generically or generally that the adaptive reuse as a strategy is between 10 to 20 5%, depending on the type of building, for those core parts of a building. And one thing I will say, services is an interesting one. Um, in this building, it's probably quite a high value of services for adaptive reuse because you have beautiful things such as copper pipes, cast iron pipes, sorts of things that actually have an incredibly long life, whereas uh, in modern buildings, we really don't see the use of copper piping into water infrastructure or um, uh, uh, chill water because it's a relatively expensive commodity. Um, so, but it is a particularly good area to look at because it is very much an industry thing these days to say, you know what, it's cheaper and easier just to chuck it out and start again. But in actual fact, it's worthwhile thinking about. We recently did a, a major renovation of services on an office building um, with investor property management. And we went down this pathway and actually avoided about 20% of the embodied carbon of what was otherwise going to be a big mechanical upgrade because our consultant said, you know what, I think there's something in that because we do have great copper pipes. And so they actually went through quite an interesting exercise looking at what could we reuse and it did actually radically change the time and the cost of the project from, for the betterment as well as the embodied carbon. So then when we think about the strategy of net zero, what does net zero mean for us from an embodied carbon perspective? It's really about looking at, well, how, how can we squish down what is the embodied carbon? And then we look at what are the pathways to avoid that? How do we get that down as far as possible before we end up saying, well, where can we get to, what, what can we do with the rest of it? This image sort of tries to tell you the core, what we call the core design principles that we look at as uh, areas of opportunity. Um, Dematerialise, build, no build. It's the very first question we would ask in a strategy around how do we deal with embodied carbon. Um, and of course, this is where the adaptive reuse, retention and the valuation of heritage comes in. Because the build, no build has the highest value to us from an embodied carbon point of view because we are certain and it is a, it's, it's taken today. It's a sure thing that it is avoided and so it has the highest value to us. And then we look at recycled content, supply chain, etc. And then the idea is that what is left over, we then look at the life cycle of the building, the, the lifespan, what is it practically going to give us? Is it going to be 50 years? Is it going to be 60 years? And then we annualise. So then whatever's left over, we segment that into its annual components. And then that little annualised piece of embodied carbon, we then say, well, what can we do with that? Is it possible for us to offset that on site? Or can we do it off-site? Or what are the options for us? So I sort of look at, I, I do actually look at this building and I actually wonder if we were to look at the valuation of the embodied carbon here, what are you going to do to retain it? And then look at your other assets of national heritage, your lands, your uh, wild spaces that also need work. It seems plausible to me, off the back of my fag packet, <laughs> that there is a story there and an opportunity from a strategy point of view to say, you know what, maybe we could achieve net zero whole building, not just operating, but whole building, by leveraging our other assets of natural heritage to look at sequestering, to look at re repair, retention in other national assets. And that, I think, would be a really interesting story about how to talk back to the broader objectives of the national heritage strategy. So, the Sirius building. The Sirius is a very controversial site um, and also, I mean, it is a beautiful piece of architecture, much like this building. So, personally, I was really uh, pleased to be part of this uh, bid process because I really love these features and st style of architecture. Um, and uh, I was lucky to work with BVN. BVN Architects, I think, are the leaders in this country for sustainable architecture. I noticed the Matraville uh, Library is to be discussed here today. BBN and uh, that library and presumably the consultants here, Heritage Consultants, were all loving that uh, national award that they just recently won for architecture and retention. Um, and it, so working with them has been fantastic. Their vision for the project was always about retention, restoration and reimagination. And part of that 
from a cultural point of view, was very much arising out of the social issues and the social commitment of many stakeholders to this actual site itself. So the valuation methodology, um, in terms of sort of even just having a starting point, the question was also, is net zero possible? What is the role of this? It's going to be controversial no matter what we do. And so how do we weave in the story of the value and the importance of the retention and the carbon and the environmental strategy? So the valuation methodology um, that we apply and using um, obviously our calculations and tools and data was very much about, well, what's the knockdown rebuild solution? What does that look like from an embodied carbon point of view? And then what is the established value of the actual physical quantification of what was there, the existing assets? Um, but fortunately, BVN had a very developed Revit model which made our quantification uh, processes relatively simple in terms of engaging with how many square metres of walls, slabs, structure and uh, envelope that was existing and its specification. Uh, and having these tools at large and then leveraging Revit and 3D modelling uh, certainly made um, the process um, very quick and simple for us to be able to come up with some ideas. One thing I'll just say um, was the amount of debate Section J for uh, residential buildings makes for glazing to be very challenging. Uh, and given the iconic views and the sort of uh, price point for uh, sales that uh, were needed to even support the finances of the project, that led to clear glass is the solution <laughs> versus the code saying black glass is the solution. And then on top of that, we had floor-to-floor -floor heights. The floor-to-floor -floor height internally of these of, of the building is actually only just on 2.4. So even having large framed windows was going to be a challenge. Having external uh, facade attenuation was not possible. So there was an enormous amount of, well, how much do we really need? And then this payback and the trade-off between embodied carbon to add all this stuff versus operating carbon saving and how could we look at what is the right sort of solution for a performance outcome that met all of those different stakeholder needs. Ultimately, when we looked at the core elements of the building, we estimated that just from the, um, the concrete walls, etc., there was about an 8,000 tonne retention reuse solution. So from a mathematical point of view, when we looked at our knockdown rebuild, there was about 50,000 tonnes of CO2 in the knockdown rebuild solution. And then once we looked at the retention, applying that retention, looking at then what can we do actually on site with everything else, the existing copper, the windows, how did we reuse those windows rather than throwing them out, concepts around grounding, grinding them up and incorporating them back into terrazzo and tiles because brand new bathrooms are very high uh, high, high cost apartments want a very shiny sort of finish. So there was a lot of work done around how did we use as much on site as possible that was otherwise not in a good purpose for its current, you know, immediate repurpose, but what was another solution on the site? A lot of brick uh, that was going to be repurposed and reorganised into public realm. Um, a lot of, there was some timber, there's a couple of, um, uh, there's a community room that was pretty much going to be retained altogether. And then there was extension to the building. So ultimately, when we looked at the actual end solution, we have here structural retention, quantified here at around about that 7,000 tonnes for the elements that were new build because there was new square meterage that was going to be added on. But this was going to come in the form of pods prefabricated high recycle content pods that would enable fast construction methodology which also saves us embodied carbon and we would subject those to at least the 50% embodied carbon reduction target. Then there was fit out targets and that was achieved through looking at these things like very uh, low embodied carbon finishes, beautiful plaster finishes, cork finishes because we literally had no floor space, anything. We couldn't add a suspended ceiling because you only had 2.4 to play with. Um, and so altogether, uh, we had uh, a solution where we avoided something overall in the order of uh, 14,000 tonnes of carbon. When we looked at that from an operating carbon point of view, 
uh, just looking at, well, could we even claim some sort of net zero on site because of the embodied carbon avoided? We calculated that out as being worth about 30 to 34 years of operating carbon. So people operating in that building, owning and operating and living in that building for 34 years effectively as net zero by taking that approach. Some pictures, I think I'm, I've run out of time. Some pictures looking at uh, the structure, the pods, the roof gardens. The challenge of the clear glass, which was uh, incredibly difficult, maintaining the views. I think they were looking for it. They're looking sort of, I don't know, without talking out of turn because it's public, public information, $30 million for the major penthouse. It's gorgeous. Brickwork and the pods. I'm happy to show the pictures a bit later. So in summary, I think uh, when we look at the role of retention and certainly your dialogue here today about a net zero goal and target for this particular beautiful building, I think you've certainly got a plausible pathway to consider looking at all these different options um, and uh, I'd sort of certainly think that um, it would be an outstanding thing to actually see that achieved. And thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak with you today. take one of the seats and the other speakers could come up and join us for the question time. And I'm sorry to hurry you up, Caroline. Um, it was such a fascinating case study. And um, yeah, if um, Hans and Michael can jo join Caroline and Ty, come back Ty. Sure. Oh, great. <laughs> so. Let's see how I can handle this. First, the first question's to Hans. Um, and how to improve the place to better function as a place for knowledge exchange? Well, I think there's many pathways. Uh, there's the hidden ones I mentioned, which is the technology that plays an increasing role. Um, and I think then there is the functionality of the building as a meeting place. Uh, so I think ergonomics is one of the uh, areas we're looking at. And actually, um, the stage we're looking here as a live audience, we can imagine other formats that we can't produce with a stage like that. And we're, you know, is it possible to make this disappear on the floor was one of our questions. So we have different styles of presentations. Um, th those would be high on my list. Great. Thanks, Hans. That's really interesting. The, the next question is to Ty. Um, what elements might be measured under a climate active certification, Ty? Uh, things that might be measured under climate active um, certification. Well, I think some of them, uh, the, the obvious ones are around operational energy, uh, and that's around all the elements uh, and all the systems in the building and, and how much energy they, they consume. So lighting systems, uh, air conditioning systems, um, the, the amount of water that's consumed. Um, then when you extend outside of that, it, it also looks into uh, sort of the resource streams that are associated with the building or the facility and, and how it operates. So uh, waste and the kind of waste that it's generating and where it's going. Um, and any other sort of uh, carbon inputs that might, the facility might be using. So uh, paper um, or indeed anything else that might be coming in that we're, we're not, not aware of, we, we would need to do an audit in the first place. Mm. So those would be some of the things that would be measured. Fantastic, thanks Ty. Um, next question, I might read it out. Um, it might go to Caroline, I think. So it's interesting to see carbon emissions tied to the dome's electricity use, um, for example, in uh, Ty's presentation. How does this account for the fact that the ACT sources all electricity from renewable sources? And should the reduction of ele electricity use be a priority in this context? Um, I think that's Ty. Well, Ty? Ty? <laughs> Hans, Hans. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a completely valid question, and we were just debating this uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I wouldn't even use the word debate; it's um, discussion. Um, it's because yes, uh, you know the ACT context is unique in, in that respect, and therefore the building is like at an already very good starting point. Um, but you know, 
despite of that, the amount of energy that the building consumes is still too much for a building of its size. So even though we may be you know, consuming electricity from a, from a zero carbon source, the quantum of energy that it's consuming is still really too much. And there are a whole range of things that we can do to drop it. And so that, that, that contributes to you know, the, the total story around, around, this, around, uh, around, around the building and, and what we're doing. Because to reduce the fuel consumption, if we just use, which is considered as a, as a term, um, is still of great benefit to the world, to Australia, um, because the less resources we use in building like this, the, the, the easier it is for us to, to achieve the bigger overarching you know, civilization objective. So understand, understand the question, um, but we, uh, it's, it's still, it's, I, would, I would say we're still, those things that, are, um, that I was referring to earlier are, are still valid irrespective of the fact that the electricity might be coming from mm. um, uh, zero energy source. Great. Thanks. Hans, would you like to add to that? Yes, please. Uh, in a similar vein. So the first step is to go away from gas. You saw the beautiful picture of the old boiler that lasted 60 years up to earlier this year and then gave up. And so we're going all electric and then obviously at the same time minimize the electricity and, and minimize the total energy use even if it's all renewable, maybe someone else in Canberra can use it for a good purpose, and we don't have to, so. Great, thank you. Now, for, for Caroline, um, uh, one questioner was wondering whether you measured the transportation of materials um, in your calculations. A fairly specific question there. Uh, the answer is yes. So the figures that I was showing are what we call cradle to site and includes all of the interstitial transport of materials. So that's from the transport of the truck that digs the iron ore to the ship that sends it to China to the ship that brings it back. And fortunately, we have now terrific inventories around the world that give us high quality data associated with all the movements and the transport emissions intensity. One thing I would like to say is that it has been the case and the perception or the belief that it is a very big component of a lot of materials. And the reality is now that we have much better computational methods is that it's not necessarily always the biggest thing to be worried about. So sometimes when we talk about local stuff, it's not necessarily best because local production of a material may be higher than an overseas source and that shipping is actually n not as intense as everybody thinks. In fact, it's the truck movements that actually end up being the most intense that we need to worry about. But that's a great question. Thank you. Mm, thank you. There are uh, quite a few more questions, but um, I think to keep to our tight schedule this afternoon, um, I'll draw this session to a close um, and we'll have a couple of minutes break uh, before coming back for our um, case studies. So literally just um, two minutes, um, I think, to um, stretch your legs. But please um, join me in a round of applause for th those um, fabulous presentations. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, we're going to resume the proceedings now. Uh, you, you're allowed to, uh, yes. Sit in the audience now. Thank you for joining us again online. We're just trying to round up the in real life audience. So humans, assume your positions, please. <laughs> so just give us a few moments, online audience. Um, people have gone to get water. <laughs> Okay, I think we should make a start. Um, so session two um, will focus on some case studies for sustainability practices um, and how they relate to heritage buildings in Australia. Um, and we'll have uh, three case studies and we'll follow the case studies with a round table um, and the round table will uh, involve all of the speakers from this afternoon um, and we'll start off with a response to the proceedings today led by Susan MacDonald, who is um, our second special guest and Susan is Head of Building and Sites at the Getty Conservation Institute, who, uh, which has been doing um, a lot of important work on this topic. So, to start off, we have Catherine Forbes, who's the principal of GML Heritage, who's going to talk to us about Marrickville Library adaptation and sustainability. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here and in person rather than just online. So, Marrickville Library, this is a, uh, as pointed out, this uh, bill particular project has won numerous awards this year um, from the National Awards from the Australian Institute of Architects but also the National Trust Awards for Heritage. Uh, so it's won them in public architecture, sustainability and adaptive reuse and so it seems like a very good case study to be looking at today. So this is the adaptation of a former hospital, Marrickville Hospital, and it looks at providing a sustainable future for the heritage, which is the hospital, and a sustainable future for the community. And achieving sustainability outcomes was the primary focus of all decision making for this project. So in this particular context, I'm looking at sustainability in a much broader um, range of activities. So we're looking at environmental sustainability, but also economic social and cultural sustainability. So we've talked about mainly environmental sustainability this morning, but 
we also need to think about um, the viable use of a place and making sure that it's not underused, that it's affordable. For social sustainability, we're looking, about, looking at the community, social connectivity and accessibility. And for cultural sustainability, it's maintaining our culture for future generations. And that can include uh, cultural identity, a sense of place, an intergenerational transfer of knowledge. So just a little bit of background. This is the Marrickville Library. It was opened as a cottage hospital in 1900. Uh, it was gradually added to over the years um, with additional wards and operating theatres and so on. Uh, there's a new entrance and tower built in 1913, a two-storey ward block, which is the main hospital building that I'll be talking about today. That was built in 1927. And it was added to over many years. And then the hospital closed in 1991 because it could no longer meet the requirements of healthcare in Australia. So the site was left redundant, empty and derelict. In 1995, Marrickville Council purchased the site and began to explore options for its future. So it was important to note that the building is located in the civic centre of Marrickville, on the main street at the junction between the residential area, the commercial area and the civic precinct. It contains heritage buildings and many of the buildings around it are also heritage. So you can see some of them here, church, fire station, town hall, and so on. The economic context, it had no viable use and there were no funds to repair or adapt the building. The social context, there was definitely a need for community facilities in the area and environmentally, it was back and a contaminated hole in the middle of Marrickville, basically. So the council had a vision to create a new community hub at the centre of Marrickville's civic precinct to revitalise the site and the precinct. It ran a select design competition in 2011, and in which was won by BVN in 2012. So the same architects that are looking at the Sirius building, and I've worked with them on other projects as well. So the project team includes the Inner West Council, who have been absolutely key to the whole project. They've guided it from beginning to end and kept their eye on their vision. Uh, we, GML provided the heritage input, BVN the architects, Steenson Varming the engineers on the project, Mervac the developers and CD construction of the builders. So first of all, we'll look at social sustainability because this was really key to the the council's approach to this project. So we're looking at connecting community and place. So the whole site is open access and very welcoming. People can walk right through it. So hospital lane, which went down the middle of the hospital, is now a community thoroughfare that links the local residential area through to the civic heart of Marrickville. It is a meeting place. It's got public open space that can be used for community events. It has playground, cafe, park, and all of it is fully accessible. It has spaces for meeting and working together within the buildings. The space for creativity and learning, social networking. It's got study spaces, large and small, and it's got an indoor amphitheatre and meeting rooms. I should say that the library contains two of the old hospital buildings, the 1927 building and the 1908, uh, 1905 ward building with the 1913 entrance. But there's also a nurse's home on the site which has been retained as well uh, and it includes this new building. But economic sustainability required a development partner so, because the council could not finance it. So they looked for a partner who would actually fund the construction of the new building and the community facilities and the conservation and adaptation of the heritage buildings. And, and so they 
uh, Mervac came to the party here and so they were allowed to develop multi-unit housing on the site. They've adapted the nurses' home for residences as well. And then the council retained ownership of the hospital buildings, which is the 1927 building and the 1905 building. And these, the large building is part of the library and the smaller building is being leased out to provide an income for the ongoing care and maintenance of the site. Cultural sustainability, so maintaining the sense of place that was the hospital. So you can see on the top the image of the hospital when we started on the project and then what, what it is like now. So the, that whole streetscape has re been revitalised. It's residences just across the road, but up at the corner it's the main street going into Marrickville and the commercial precinct. Strengthening that sense of place. So one of the very important features of these buildings are the verandas. And I didn't point it out earlier, but on the patients would spend time sitting on verandas looking out, light, air, and were considered really important to maintaining good health and recovery of patients from being ill. So the hospital, uh, the verandas from the hospital are still a very important feature of this building. So, but you looking out over Marrickville from the northern verandas. The southern verandas look into the site over the public spaces. But then there's also the veranda where you're looking into the library itself. And so they're very key to the whole experience of the place. Oops, okay. uh, experience of the hospital wards. So you can see that some of those have been adapted as library spaces where you, with bookcases, but others are workspaces for large work areas and small work areas. And even the small rooms that used to be the bathrooms have been adapted as small study spaces and meeting rooms. Cultural sustainability and connecting with the local history of the area. And so the library connects the community to the place that it's in and its heritage, including the Aboriginal heritage. So on the corner of the building, of the new building, is an Aboriginal artwork which is all in Aboriginal language. Um, there's storytelling throughout the site in the artworks and displays. So uh, down on the bottom right you can see a wall with faces. They're the faces of the children that worked in the local brickworks and who would a local resident took them after they finished work and taught them to read. And that's, very, that's a theme throughout the interpretation in the library, it is about learning and reading and education. So there's lots of storytelling. The library runs regular tours, um, talks. I've given a couple of lectures there, others have as well. Uh, and we also have artefacts that were found during the construction, which are now on display to tell the story of the hospital and the, pa the patients that were there, the nursing staff, the, the way the buildings were used. But one of the really important things in regard to cultural sustainability is understanding that a library is a repository of knowledge, whether it's scientific, historic, philosophy, creative thinking. This is our intangible heritage and, re and really part of our cultural identity. And this is what we pass on to future generations. So a library is a very important uh, part of our heritage. So, um, but the library, as I said, runs storytelling sessions, lectures and children's activities, as well as providing access to books and knowledge and computers and lots of study areas. Environmental sustainability. Um, the greenest building is the one that already exists. We've been talking about that a little bit. Um, so adaptively reusing these buildings prolongs and gives new life to the buildings. It reduces consumption of waste of materials and energy. It reduces carbon emissions and it conserves the energy and carbon embodied in the building. Uh, we looked at the energy systems in this building and so we've supplemented what was already built into the buildings when they were built in the early 20th century. So they used natural light and natural ventilation and they were shaded verandas. 
So the new mechanical systems have been designed to supplement those, not to replace them. The materials. So there were other buildings on the site that were demolished to make way for the library. The bricks and materials from those buildings have been reused in the new building. So you can see the brick wall down the corner, but even all the internal brick walls are the bricks that were in the previous buildings on the site. Other materials, such as the timber, have all been sustainably sourced. And there's rainwater harvesting. So you can see that there. And it's all very public, so you can see all the facilities. And we've provided green space. So trees provide shade, they cool the environment in summer, and they also reduce pollution because the microbes around the roots of the trees eat eat the pollu pollutants in the air. And they're good for health and well-being of the community. So how is this relevant to the Shine Dome? We are looking at sustainability, not just environmental sustainability for the Shine Dome, but also economic, social and cultural sustainability. So thermal performance, operational energy and materials, but also flexibility of use, generating an income to support the activities, sharing the knowledge that comes from this place and maintaining the nationally significant building and its heritage values. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. And we're going to stay with um, a second speaker from GML Heritage, from the project team, uh, Rachel Jackson, who's the principal um, and member of the group Canberra Modern here in Canberra. And she's going to explore these other aspects of sustainability as well, I think, by talking about Canberra Modern yesterday, today and tomorrow. Good afternoon, everyone, in the beautiful Shine Dome and online. Um, yes, I am a principal at DML Heritage, but today I'm presenting on behalf of Canberra Modern. Um, Canberra Modern, uh, just a brief uh, introduction as to who we are, and I'll just do the green button, as Hans has said. It's very useful. I'm going forward. And a bit like my talk, it's about tomorrow. Um, so, Canberra Modern, there are three of us. Um, Amy Jarvis, the Heritage Advisor for the ANU. Um, Edwina Jans, the Head of Heritage Communication and Development at the Museum of Australian Democracy. And as you know, my day job is, is at GML Heritage and a project member for the Shine Dome Sustainability Plan. So we established Canberra Modern in 2016 and our motto is conservation through participation. We hold events for the community and we increase the awareness of Canberra's mid-century modernist character, heritage values and uniqueness. I don't know why this is moving by itself, but anyway. I'll try and go back, because you've got a really good sense. Okay. So Australia's national capital is a design city in the landscape with aspirational modern planning from the outset and that's what I termed the yesterday. The talk will look at these aspirations and the role Canberra Modern plays in engaging community in the recognition of this mid-century period of our city and for the sustainable future, so the today and the tomorrow. And I guess it's uh, less about the uh, environmental sustainability that other speakers have been talking about, but more about the cultural and social sustainability that Catherine mentioned um, and the benefits it has for the future. They're all interlinked, and that's the point of sustainability. Look, the otherness that um, Paul Daly talks about here is, you know, it is a thing. It's definitely a thing. Um, it's where, Can in Canberra, Parliament sits. It's well known for politicians and roundabouts, and often referred to as boring and dull by those outside the, the Canberra bubble, and probably some within. But Canberra wants people, to, Canberra Modern wants people to know that it's an entirely livable city and it's actually a, a well-kept secret until now, I guess. <laughs> well, I hope. Um, so this nationally significant place is the outcome of and symbol of the Federation of Australia and our home, it's our home of Australian democracy. 
And I guess I'd, I'd like to also acknowledge definitely that the place and the landscape has strong meaning for the traditional and original owners of the land. It's a special case for all Australians. It embodies modern ideals and is one of the world's greatest 20th century planned cities. It stands alongside Washington DC, Chandigarh um, and Brasilia. I guess for many decades, the place has been studied to death and probably for good reason. Um, there are many advocates who have been striving for national and international listing of the city. And in fact, the nominated um, Canberra, the planned national capital, has been languishing um, and waiting for um, a political approval for listing on the national heritage list. So the yesterday, um, many of us are familiar with um, the Griffins and the first phase of the um, international design competition that was the building of Canberra. The competition won by the Griffins um, in 1913, oh, I don't, some, is it someone up there? I don't know, it's a ghost in there, it's Marion and, and Walter. Um, I guess we, we are looking at that, the foundational phase, the phase that, they, that was built on these modern ideals. They, this was implemented by the Federal Capital Commission um, and there was a lot of time had languished between um, the implementation and the first start of the, the building of the national capital and then the second phase, which really is the phase that I'm talking about. This is the phase um, that is what I, I call the National Capital Development Commission phase or the NCDC period. It coincides definitely with the World War I, post-World War II reconstruction and recovery across the world. And quite deliberately, deliberately, the Commonwealth Government, through the commissioning, uh, through the NCDC, developed Canberra for a growing population. So these two images are really fascinating. I find um, one, the second one from the from 1970, but it does definitely indicate the enduring qualities of the di design city, and that's where the uh, NCDC continued to build on the idea of the Griffins. So you've got your land access. Uh, your view from Mount Ainsley to Capitol Hill where um, our current Parliament House is and the water access that goes through Lake Billy Griffin um, uh, through from Black Mountain to the wetlands, uh, the Jerobomba Bombera wetlands. So the wider setting of the natural landscape and the hills that form the basin of Canberra are also quite evident. It's, um, I just love how Mary and Marnie Griffin got those drawings so right from afar in Chicago. So the yesterday is still in the phase one development period of the, the Federal Ca Capital Commission development of the 1920s and 30s. And its architecture and cultu cultural plantings are appreciated and generally protected. The inner hills remain green and have not been developed. But it's this um, phase of development that most people understand as what is of heritage value, or it's got heritage, as I often hear. Um, it's recognised for heritage listing, and that's an easy, an easy fill. Um, and it's, it, it, these places are on the heritage register um, of the ACT or the Commonwealth Heritage List. Phase two. The NCDC had a big vision. Um, and as stated in their publication, The Future Canberra, 1965. It's, it's described as the glory years of Canberra's development, I should also say, and I think, um, I think they were thinking big, as Han said. A city is more than bricks and mortar. It's a reflection of society, and a national capital is bound to reflect the needs and characteristics of the nation it has built. Canberra can, can become a great and unique city in which all parts can be comprehensively developed in line with enlightened planning and in, way, in a way in which we will reflect the vigorous and generous culture of Australia. There is every reason to believe that given the necessary foresight and determination, the expansion now taking place should continue to enhance quality and character of the city. I choose that quote out of many, many great quotes um, for a reason. So to populate the future Canberra and tomorrow's Canberra, to attract people from other states, mainly Sydney and Melbourne, what better way to do that than to show how modern your life could be in one of Canberra's new suburbs 
with a very similar modern Californian style home and the lifestyle that we all saw on TV or in films at the time. It's probably a little bit pre my time, but anyway. <laughs> Um, well, the wave of modernism is obviously not unique to Canberra. Canberra as the design city in a landscape is a special case in itself. This was only possible as the NCDC and Canberra's development was definitely supported by the federal government. There was a steady and stable government investment that provided the confidence that was needed for self-generating development. And because of this, Canberra became the place that these designers were experimenting. It was an empty canvas, notwithstanding obviously the Aboriginal history and ownership of, and connection to the land. But architects and designers really thought of it as, as a blank slate. Um, the pioneer, pioneering architects and planners of the modernist movement flocked here. They were invited here. Um, they loved it. Enrico Taglietti, our own star architect, um, was a young architect from Italy and he had famously said he felt the heavy burden of history that from in Italy lighten and um, his suffocation was gone when arriving in, into Canberra. His work is so prolific around Canberra that um, it's, it, and it's unique to Canberra is all I can say, it's just wonderful. The NCDC encouraged every well-known architect, engineer, town planner, landscape architect at the time to design these major developments. What a great opportunity for an expanding city. They either worked for or were engaged by the NCDC and some of those people who were in the NCDC didn't, um, I guess they, uh, they're not as well known and we're trying to uncover the, the names of those people. Um, so any family connections or names, please let us know. The opportunities for these architects continued through to the 1980s. So the boom and the development and filling of this, um, this void provided Canberra with so many um, unique opportunities in, in an aesthetic that was quite actually unusual and very unlike any other Australian city. The, in, still in the yesterday, so many of the NCDC period buildings um, are considered innovative, extraordinary in design and of the highest quality. You know, they're in the 50 year mark, but they're just amazing. Um, granted, there's probably some exceptions to this rule out there, um, and they're probably the ones that have given the bad name to the mid-century throughout Australia for some reason, and hopefully it's coming. We're catching up to the rest of the world in understanding modernism. But in the current iteration of the NCDC, which is the National Capital Authority, their role is to oversee um, the National Capital Plan. And that plan has a statutory objective, and that's to ensure that Canberra and the Territory are planned and developed in accordance with what is called the national significance. So these icons that are on the screen here are not necessarily under threat as such, but it's the biggest um, fear, I guess, for us is that the development and the filling in of the spaces around, around these monuments and in the suburbs um, into the uh, landscape spaces that belong to the public are being filled, the overscale development, and there's lots of inconsistent suburban planning ideas, and I guess it's been criticised poor quality development. Is that what we're all about? And as, as you guessed, we're now kind of into the new phase of the Titmull of the, today, that there's a problem. <laughs> you guessed it. So following the self-government in 1988, the Commonwealth and ACT have created a very complicated system um, for planning and environmental protection. There are two systems, one place, the ACT has one community, but with the heritage controls divided between Commonwealth and Territory, the awkwardness of this two planning system and how they underpin decisions for development in the national capital is ultimately becoming detrimental and it has been for quite some time. Um, it's detrimental to the environment and the cultural heritage. And I guess in a facetious way, I've called this dual planning system um, phase three the millennial generation, a planning system that's post uh, 1980s and perhaps self-serving with very short-term outlooks. I've got 
five minutes, I've got to go pretty quick. So today doesn't need to be frozen in time, but this dual um, system is so complex that the common refrain from our poli um, politicians is that heritage is halting our development. It's an obstruction to growing city. And I don't want to pick on him necessarily, but I'm sorry, easy pickings when it's in the paper. Um, Today, these problems are manifested in, in um, examples such as Churchill House. That's a, a building by Robin Boyd, perhaps one of our most iconic um, and significant architects, and I guess a, a leading figure in international modern movement. I don't know what's happening here. Um, anyway, it's his only commercial building in Canberra, and it's his last and large, largest commission of his 35-year uh, career before he died, sadly, way too young at the age of 51. So it recently didn't meet the threshold, the high threshold for um, heritage listing in the ACT. And that's because um, there is, well, I don't know why it's because it just didn't get listed, but there is no local level listing, so there's no fallback for that either in the ACT. So why does it matter for the future and tomorrow? This is our call to action the future generation, and my daughter on the right there, <laughs> recruited by Canberra Modern, but actually she's there with her friend because they love, they love civic pool, they love the watering pools of, of, of Canberra and ponds and rivers. And, you know, this is the filling of the city to the lake. This pool will be removed um, with the city to lake development that's been a decision made some time ago. Canberra Modern's advocacy, I won't be long, <laughs> um, is informed by Amy's uh, partner in Canberra Modern, her Churchill Fellowship of last year, where she, her research and analysis of the US-based modernism and advocacy models demonstrated the power of mid-century modernism and heritage, and the outcomes of that was it should be fun and creative, transform a city in decline, engage a community, promote city pride, have a direct economic benefit, have um, addressed broad issues such as sustainability and social equity, be a strong tourism product, and be an asset to the city rather than a burden. So at the end of the day, Canberra Modern has fun events. We take people out on um, a bus that is uh, serving to demonstrate the importance of the spaces around Canberra and, and the humble bus stop designed by Clem Cummins in 1975. Um, and graphic artist Trevor Dickinson, who's made this pretty much iconic at the moment. You can go into any tourist shop and find a, um, some memorabilia of our bus stops. Um, this is a po pop-up poetry performance by CJ Bauer, a nationally acclaimed performance poet. So we do have a lot of fun. Other bus stops that Trevor chose for us included musicians, artists, cake stalls. We had a lot of fun doing that. So I, he's reading, um, for your benefit, the um, brief notes on Canberra by the acclaimed poet Judith Wright. And that was also written in 1975, so it was a nice synergy there. And, sorry, Tracy. <laughs> um, no, I, sorry, I should have, I should have. I just really wanted to say the last couple of things here was that on a positive note, while Canberra Modern has fun and in, encourages everyone to um, continue this work, we also would like to say that the new ACT Minister for the Environment and Heritage, Rebecca Vassarotti, a member of the ACT Greens, we hope can live up to her public and political statement on planning, development and heritage. So the ACT Greens will build on Canberra's history as a planned city and strong expertise in sustainable design to lead the nation in quality urban development. By bringing people together to find solutions, we will protect the things Canberrans love about our city, our trees, green space and heritage. Funding the heritage system to shift from reactive to proactive so it can protect the things we love about Canberra. That's music to my ears. Let's see if we can keep it going. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And sorry about the problem with the slides. I know it's very hard to um, to cope with that while you're trying to talk and keep to time. So Emma Gwen is next. Thanks, Emma, um, for our final case study um, before we go to our roundtable. 
And Emma is from the Museum of Australian Democracy and will uh, talk about some of the fantastic work that they have been doing there on their sustainable heritage practices. Thanks. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Shine Dome team for having us here today and everyone who's online. Environmental sustainability is more relevant in 2020 than ever before, and heritage practice and energy efficiency and sustainability are complementary in their common goals to retain, adapt, and reuse. At Old Parliament House, sustainability is integral with the ways we manage the values of the place in the National Heritage Management Framework and a program of critical modernisation upgrades is helping us to reach these goals for a sustainable and thriving future. Old Parliament House has outstanding heritage values shaped by its pivotal role in the political and social history of Australia and its important place in the evolution of Australian democracy. Old Parliament House symbolises and reflects the development of Australia as a nation and was the first purpose-built home for Australian Parliament. Today, the building houses the Museum of Australian Democracy, which celebrates the spirit of democracy and the power of our voices within it. And as it turns out, it also houses an unquantified amount of embodied carbon. The Old Parliament House Heritage Management Plan frames the policies and decision making within the context of the EPBC Act, the Borough Charter, and for the unique and complex place that is Old Parliament House. Environmental management is written into our Heritage Management Plan, and the EPBC Act identifies and defines the principle of ecological sustainable development that should underpin decision making and define key heritage management principles. For Old Parliament House, this means managing the change that is inevitable in keeping the place alive and relevant. So I'm going to give a very, very brief overview of some examples of how we're doing this. Starting with the Boilers Upgrade project. This Heritage Award winning project was presented at the International Conference of Energy and Efficiency in Historic Buildings in Madrid in 2014. The project has really set the scene for Old Parliament House for modernisation upgrades that have happened in the years since. The central heating plant located in the South Wing boiler room heats and distributes hot water throughout the building to wall-mounted hydronic radiators and air handlers where the heat is emitted to the space. This type of heating plant that provides the hot water has varied significantly throughout the history of the building, from the original 1927 coal-fired boilers, followed by oil-fired boilers from 1957 uh, electric boilers from 1978, natural gas from 94, and throughout this history, the boilers all flewed into the original brick chimneys from 1927. So with this most recent upgrade, the original chimneys were not suitable for continued use in the same way. Minimising the impact on the heritage values while meeting current installation requirements presented challenges. The original 1927 chimney's external appearance was retained through an innovative solution of installing three new stainless steel flues in, within the existing brick chimneys. As much extant fabric and redundant plant equipment as possible was left in place in the boiler room. The rear facade of the building retained its appearance within the parliamentary vista and the chimneys retained their continuity of use with this new configuration. And you can see the results of this spoiler upgrade alone in the 2014 stats on the slide. In 2020, another part of the heating system has now been upgraded. The hydronic radiators had become pitted and corroded over time, and in some areas, 50% of the pipe wall thickness had been lost. We worked collaboratively with industry to investigate innovative new technologies to extend the life of the radiators. And we retained the original fabric. 
a radiator from the Heritage Collection was selected or sacrificed for trial treatment using Redline technology. Redline is an epoxy resin-based coating system that prevents leaks, corrosion and mineral buildup in plumbing. The inside of the radiator was cleaned and treated for rust before the resin was applied inside. The radiator was rotated on a jig to ensure that the, all of the internal surfaces were evenly coated and two layers of the resin were applied in the same manner and cured. Finally, the external surfaces were finished with enamel paint to match it, the existing colour. The trial was found to be successful and to confirm the results, the radiator was cut in half to view a cross section of the thickness and consistency of the coating and both were found to be successful. Following this pilot, 52 radiators were documented, carefully transported to Queensland for the relining treatment and they've now been reinstated and returned to service. Uh, and we were able to enjoy that lovely radiated heat this winter. The approach maintains the original heritage fabric that makes up part of the story of the building and its significant engineering heritage. It has extended the expected operational life of the radiators by 50 years, making it an environmentally sustainable example of retaining and reusing. In another project linked to the boiler upgrade and the radiator refurbishment, further efficiencies have been made across the building by undertaking an upgrade of heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems in a major project over the past three years. The HVAC plants and systems ranged from 15 to 45 years old and we needed to provide sustainable systems into the future. Old Parliament House is a complex site with a range of systems and requirements and the solutions needed for the upgrade were tailored to the needs of each part and area of the building. Risks to the heritage values included uh, building fabric removal where openings needed to be enlarged, demolition in sensitive spaces and new duct runs. Much of the work involved removal of false ceilings, coring through brick walls in ceiling spaces, and we needed to manage all of the various changes with the least possible impact to the values. The lighting upgrade project happened concurrently with this upgrade across the building over the three year period. And it was generally rolled out uh, in, in line with the HVAC in the same areas. So quite disruptive as you can imagine. A mix of ex existing fluorescent, compact fluorescent, halogen and LED lights were upgraded with new white or coloured LEDs. With centrally program pro programmable and dimmable controls. In some cases, refurbishing the lights meant updating earlier LEDs or fluorescent retrofits. The pendant lights in Kings Hall had undergone previous major conservation and structural uh, treatment work and had been rewired and future-proofed, retaining as much po as possible of the original intern internal fittings. With the newer high-spec LEDs, more of the original fittings had to be removed to make space for the equipment. With careful documentation and storage, all the original parts have been retained for the heritage collection for reinstating when the lighting technology gets smaller in the future. We found that some of the lights in the building needed to be replaced because they either couldn't be retrofitted or they were broken or missing. Discussions around what should be used for replacement lights raise some really interesting and recurrent questions. Should we faithfully replicate the existing? If so, should we match the original materials used or should we use a modern equivalent? Should we use a completely new modern equivalent fitting rather than a recreation of a light fitting? What do we do if we need to replace one light in a series? Do we have a representative sample in situ or in the collection? How much of the original fabric should we keep for the collection? And in answering all of these questions, we always came back to significance, values and use to find the right answer on a case by case for each type of light. The lighting upgrade project helped inform a review of the old Parliament House light management strategy, which sets out policies 
to guide our approach to lighting and it documents the decision making process for the record and to inform future decisions. Through improving efficiency of the uh, HVAC system and upgrading the lighting system across the building, we've seen a reduction of energy consumption month by month. For gas usage, we're now seeing a 5 to 15% reduction in energy consumption, and for electricity, 20 to 25% reduction when compared with the same time last year. Collection management practices and standards for environmentally controlled collection, storage and display are a factor when considering our carbon footprint and operating uh, efficiencies. In the context of a global conversation about museum standards, MOED is shifting towards a risk-managed approach to temperature and humidity controls for collection storage. At our off-site collection storage facility at Fishwick, the heating the Heritage Furniture Collection has been assessed for suitability to be stored with passive environmental controls. The main storage room has been fitted out with insulation on the ceiling, walls and under the slab floor and improvements were made to the seal of the building envelope. Our data shows that the passive condition room, which is, at, the passive condition room is within the target of 40 to 60% relative humidity for 98% of a yearly cycle, which is an excellent result and suitable for the materiality of the collection stored in, in that space. I don't have the energy cost savings figures, but savings, operating savings would be significant compared with mechanically conditioning that space to the strict traditional museum standards. As collecting museums, we can consider ways to reduce our carbon footprint and significantly reduce operating costs while still meeting appropriate standards of collection care. So how are we able to do all of these things and still maintain the heritage values of Old Parliament House? Our most successful projects, uh, we've found that collaboration and innovation have been key to finding the solutions that are specific to the site and taking the time to develop these solutions through researching, conducting trials, monitoring the results and not getting caught up in the pace of other project drivers. And all of this feeds into our strategic direction that Old Parliament House, we continue to refine and develop and continue our goal of nil decline in heritage values. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, for giving us that um, example. Now, we um, have a response to the papers that we've heard this afternoon from um, Susan MacDonald, who, as I mentioned, is Head of Building and Sites at the Getty Conservation Institute. And unbeknownst to the audience here, Susan has been behind this shroud. Um, and she's now been revealed to the audience. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much um, for joining us, um, Susan. Would you like to um, uh, give us your thoughts? Sure. Uh, thank you so much um, for inviting me to be part of this really fascinating afternoon and hear about uh, this really great work and this innovative approach um, to con conservation of the um, Academy of Sciences Shine Dome and to hear some of the other case studies that have been presented um, this afternoon. Um, can I just start by giving a huge congratulations to the Australian Academy of Science? Uh, good conservation outcomes really rely on good stewards and it's always so fantastic when you have a building owner who really understands and embraces um, their role in stewarding a building and how that can contribute not just to, to its own mission and work but it aligns with values of conservation and in this case aligning with values of things like advancing knowledge, uh, science-based decision making and scholarship and communication. Uh, it's just so exciting for heritage practitioners when we get to work with stewards like that and we have a meeting of the minds and I just wanted to note 
that um, this group kind of joins a, a group of sort of an elite club really of international science institutions who've really shown a deep commitment to conserving their modern buildings and recognize the link between the process of conservation and stewardship of these buildings and um, and their work. And I mentioned the Salk Biological Institute um, and which was the, the outcome of uh, scientist Jonas um, Salk and, and architect Lou Kahn's great work and the work that that institution has done recently. Uh, things, buildings like the Royal um, uh, the Royal College of Physicians in London. So, um, uh, it, so you know, congratulations to um, the Academy. Uh, I think implicit in the title of today's symposium is this idea that seeking recognition for the use of and care for places needs to be done in a way that secures their future in ways that sustain what's important about them, but also how can the act of conservation and ongoing stewardship of a place contribute to greater societal needs and specifically uh, the sustainability agenda. Um, I think our sector has long recognised this link, uh, but struggled with the ability to communicate how conserving cultural heritage places contributed to the, the sustainable development goals as they're now identified in the 2030 agenda and vice versa, how addressing other goals contributes to cultural heritage conservation. Um, so, you know, how might retention and conservation of existing buildings contribute to environmental sustainability? Things um, that have been talked about today, uh, carbon mitigation, how might um, conservation of a place uh, contribute to the, the, the issue of social sustainability? Uh, you know, a place like this one contributing to social cohesion, providing a space for society uh, to come together around scientific research and advancement and communication of this knowledge to the scientific community and more broadly. And I, and I guess there's sort of at no time in my lifetime has this been uh, more important than right now. And, you know, I live in the US, so um, just, yeah, an interesting thing for me to reflect on as part of this. Um, or the question of cultural sustainability, how might interpretation and sharing the stories of a place contribute to the cultural life of a city and how might understanding the past inform our future um, and all the other things that, that Catherine Forbes talked about. Um, these are things that I think our sector is slowly getting better at communicating. Uh, the needs long been recognised and, and discussed, but I think some siloism and discord even within our own sector about what this means and, and how to qualify it, um, to quantify it and to communicate it has been quite a long time coming. I, I think we're getting better at this. We're becoming less silo. We're more open to discussions about where conservation uh, fits and more honest about its role and contribution. And we now do have a seat at the table in the international discussions via the work of organisations like um, ICOMOS and the, the Sustainable Development Goals Working Group. And, um, and Heritage has now been much better integrated into formal indicators, which is a good step forward. However, I would say that whilst there's been a lot of talk and discussion, this need to qualify, quantify and communicate um, how conservation might contribute has not really been operationalized very well. Um, and what we do need are better mechanisms and tools to help us to do uh, just that. Um, which is why I think it was so exciting to see the work that was presented uh, here today in your proposal for the Shine Dome, but also that work presented by Dr. Nola, whose organisation um, has done this so well uh, generally, and, and how that might now be applied to heritage places is important. Um, I think it's also great to see how such research is advancing. Um, it's been very hard in the past. Some of our previous attempts have been really limited by the way um, the life cycle assessment work has been framed, the, the focus on operational issues. Um, and I think increasingly there has been work by the, you know, the National Trust for Historic Preservation in the US's Green Lab, the work by some of the heritage agencies in the UK have specifically, specifically focused um, attention on the issue of environmental sustainability and advocating for reuse uh, and recognition and, and, and trying to, to deal with this um, reliance on, on new building as economic growth. Um, and all of this has been really important for modern buildings specifically, which have come under greater criticism than buildings of other due to some of the challenges related to uh, 
what it has been um, leveled at them as unsustainable materials, short life cycles, toxic materials, high energy use, um, and sometimes faster cycles of decay and necessary intervention and this question of tight fit to function. Um, I think we're getting much better at being able to manage these challenges and, and case studies like this one and some of the others that we've heard today on the Marrickville Library and um, Old Parliament House really start to demonstrate how we've been reconciling the, some of these environmental challenges. Uh, we're about to publish um, a, uh, the second in our case study book, Conserving Modern Heritage Case Studies, a book on um, energy management for modern buildings, and that includes 12 case studies that try and do just that, um, and, and pick up some of the tools that were uh, outlined by, um, by Ty and GHD's really interesting work on building, understanding building performance, and then using compu um, computerized modeling to sort of to predict different and identify different solutions. So um, I think the climate emergency is upon us. Um, so we have to step up and conservation of heritage places has to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So to go back to your, your specific um, sustainability plan for this particular building and how you're trying to reframe and embrace sustainability and um, wrap these two things together, I think is one that could have um, real benefits. Um, I think that integration of a life cycle assessment uh, uh, process within that work, I think is gonna be really interesting. That work and the sort of work that Ty was showing us can really help us test some of the assumptions about, conserve, about modern buildings. You know, the common phrase that's used now is that their life cycle is about half as long as those of longer buildings. Is that really true? As more of these life cycle assessments and other uh, performance models are done, that'll tell us if that's really true or not, or if it's worse than that or better than that. And so I think access to this real live data and information is gonna be super helpful for us. Um, the question then comes, what might this mean for us in conserving modern buildings and how we approach their conservation? Uh, do we need to be thinking more strategically, uh, thinking about some of the ideas that Caroline, that, um, that Dr. Nolith um, put out there about a strategic approach for um, for, for looking at um, uh, how we think about not just for individual buildings but across other heritage sites. I thought that was that was super interesting. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the project progresses um, and how it's received. Uh, and I really look forward to, to that um, process. And I know we're quite short on time and there's probably a lot of questions. So um, I'm happy to, to um, leave it there. I did have a few questions of my own. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Tracy, but but I know you may have many from the audience as well. So oh, should I leave we... that to you to decide how to progress that? Great. Thanks, Susan, for those um, really insightful uh, comments on the proceedings th today. Yes, round of applause for Susan. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we now have uh, we now have all the speakers up um, around you, Susan, um, in a in a round table. But I'd be very happy for you to throw out a question. Um, to any of the speakers, if you would like to, and then I'll. Sure. Mm. Okay. Um, I was just interested to hear um, from Ty um, uh, the, the sort of work that he was doing um, in relation to the uh, understanding building energy behaviour and things. I thought was really interesting, and just to tie it back to. Um, Emily's presentation about collections care as well. And, and at, the, at the Getty, we're doing a lot of research on really taking a long, hard look at standards of environmental necessity control for uh, collections and rethinking that and reframing that about real need as opposed to sort of blanket standards. Um, and I was really interested to, to know from Ty how common this type of uh, research and investigation for existing buildings um, was that, that he's doing and, um, and how often that might be being integrated into um, solutions for existing buildings or heritage buildings or, or others. Sure. So um, actually in, in our line of work, so in that sort of this, the, the market that we, we work in, existing buildings and relifing existing buildings is a growing part of our business mm -hmm. um, across, across the nation. Uh, we've been involved in a number of um, fantastic projects that look at extending the, the life of existing buildings that have been around for you know, 40, 50, 60 years and transforming them into a high performance, high quality, uh, office, for example, for 
groundwater uh, um, headquarters down in Geelong and here in Victoria, you know, taking, taking an existing 1950s building and turning it into a 21st century, 22nd century, almost carbon zero building. We are seeing more and more of that in the marketplace and that methodology and the approach that we take on there, which has been highlighted and talked about mm. through you know, a number of uh, speakers here, I would say um, is becoming quite normal and therefore gives us some hope that this normality will extend and turn into um, you know, stories that we can talk about in 10 or 15 years to see that graph drip or drop mm -hmm. as opposed to drip downwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And if I could just ask a second part part of that, which um, um, kind of comes back to Dr. Noller's work too. I mean, do you see in the work that that um, is being done on the um, other the the work that um, Dr. Noller talked about as well? Do you see a big difference in buildings from say the 19th century, the mid 20th century, and then ones towards the 20th century in the out in the performance um, and the ability to meet? Uh, you know, carbon, major carbon reduction within them? Yeah, um, you know, it's climate specific uh, and there's also a layer of uh, sort of historical context because what's old here in Australia is different to what is old in the UK, you know, where I spent most of my upbringing uh, and is different to what is old in, in parts of China. So um, what I think as a general, general observation, you know, buildings like the ones that we're in now that have really had the time and love put into it to understand what the climate is and then design around first principles and fundamental principles in building physics and, and science. Those buildings and those structures tend to have uh, the resilience to, to continue on and we can adapt them for another 50 years. You know, we can use all the high tech equipment and, and interesting materials to, to help improve it. But those fundamental aspects of shading from the sun, orientating it the right way, having the right level of sort of mass and, and, and uh, and heaviness in the building relative to its uh, uh, environment. All those things are fundamentally really good and therefore we can use it. But what we probably find is that more recent buildings that have focused on concrete less and maybe more steel and more glass and certainly more exposure to the outside world, the artificial in interventions that we need to put in around air conditioning and you know clever systems to help moderate energy use, um, they tend to be harder to Sort of extend because that some of the fundamentals are wrong to be to be frank around you know, not 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 protecting the building from the sun for example mm -hmm. and so we, we we find you know all the buildings there's there's more stuff in there that we can work with that is beneficial um and with newer buildings that have been probably in the last 10 years there's there's less uh, i would say in a very generalized term there's less opportunity mm -hmm. to do something fantastic with them i, I might jump in there susan and ask mm -hmm. if um caroline wants to add a comment on that point. Thank you. Yeah. I would concur uh, with Ty. Mm. It is the case that, you know, where we didn't have the luxury of artificial conditioning that you spent more time thinking about, well, how is the environment going to suit this particular site? And so uh, all of that uh, pre-air conditioning technologies or era um, I think very much more adaptable uh, and more resilient to the future. And it, I don't know, it's a little bit like the disposable. Who was it that sort of said about the um, the, the camera modern, the 80s, <laughs> the disposable generation? And our buildings have seen that. I mean, when we look at, say, for example, the CBD of Sydney, whilst we could argue that most office buildings are designed for a 50 or more year life, the average lifespan of a CBD office building in Sydney has, is actually only 27, or 30, 27 to 30 years, which is a re relation around the, you know, the factors of real estate becomes more expensive and therefore knockdown rebuild is actually a viable proposition. And certainly when we look at the holes in the ground of Sydney, it's not ever slowing down. So I think that certainly sort of talks to this challenge that we're faced with is that we, we have to be thinking about adaption, repurposing, how we are actually building these buildings to be the assets of the future, or like the circular economy principle, what we build today, we actually have to come back to as a Meccano set for something else. The European standards are very interesting. Uh, if we think about motor vehicles, I like to think about buildings being like these little BMW i electric cars. Today, when you buy one of those things, 25% of that vehicle is already recycled content by law. 
75% of that vehicle has to be take backable into a reprocessing at the end of its life of component of the purchase price you pay is for that take back scheme. And it runs on electricity, which hopefully is renewable, but they're electric. So when I think of buildings, I think about, well, this is what we need to be thinking about, about the future of buildings needs to be these little electric cars that are fully circular economy. And obviously, you know, carbon is a core part of that, as is the physical materials and the operating carbon, et cetera. So, so yeah, a long way of saying, yes, I agree with Ty. Great, thank you. Um, I might jump in there then with some of the questions that we've received by email. Um, and first to Michael, um, uh, Stuart Mitchell from the audience has asked um, how this project has been funded. Is that your question, Stuart? Around, yeah. Yeah, and yes, so perhaps yeah. we didn't explain that well Yeah, enough, sure, of course. So. Yeah, so um, either um, if it wasn't clear from the opening comments um, or acknowledged um, by uh, early, so um, the Sustainable Australian Dome Project um, is funded in uh, by the Australian Government through the Australian Heritage Grants Program 2019-20. Um, I won't go into detail about the, the overall program, but I think broadly it's a four or five year commitment um, from the Australian Government um, to uh, support work like this on places listed on the Australian Heritage List. So the Academy Sciences building, now known as the Shine Dome, is one of those places. Um, and so uh, there was a competitive open uh, grant call, I guess, uh, I'm looking at Tracy and Hans, we, you know, 15 months ago or so. So we, we were successful in our grant bid. Um, and uh, this project will run we, um, through mid-2021. Um, as through the published documents, uh, the grant award for this project, all, all, I think there were 20 grants awarded, um, and it's all published on the uh, Department of Environment side. Uh, the grant awarded to this team was $238,000. Great. And, and there was a second part to Stuart's question, um, which um, he threw to Rachel about um, how important do you think, Rachel, the heritage listing of the Shine Dome um, was to, you know, being able to um, stage a process like this and, um, and do you think the future of the building is insured given threats to other heritage listed sites such as the Australian War Memorial? Thanks, Stuart. <laughs> um, I think there is a strong bias in understanding heritage and, and national heritage um, listed places National leadership is demonstrated towards buildings that have this iconic status, um, which is um, is a good thing for staging something like this because we've got creative thinkers and, and forward-looking people um, working in this organisation. Um, and I don't know, I have to repeat Stuart's question because I, there were two parts to it. <laughs> Well, it was, I think it was, um, he's saying, would this have happened if the Shine Dome wasn't heritage listed? <laughs> well, yeah, in terms of a process, it wouldn't be eligible because it's not on, it had to be on the process. national list. Yeah, it's, yeah. Process, right? it's totally a process driven thing. But uh, I suppose, yes, it's not always the end of the story, is it? And, and the Canberra modern um, take on that would be that heritage is really from a local level ground up. What, what does the community value about places that they live in and care about and um, support? It's a bit of a in my backyard attitude. And I, don't, I think there needs to be greater level of national leadership around that. So that's the other side of, of, of that coin. Right. It's got to be around local level heritage and um, community engagement in that process of understanding our places. Ideally, the, a planning system that didn't require such a regulatory hierarchy of heritage listing would also be better. You know, we start with sustainability in the environment. We've heard from people here that, um, you know, the embodied energy in these places, the cultural sustainability, they're all significant parts of the places in which we live. And, um, you know, why don't we just value them? Why don't we start with the basis of protecting them first before we uh, seek approval for demolition? Thanks, Rachel. Yes, what I'm going to do, because we have to uh, wind up, is that I'm going to ask um, Catherine, Hans and Emma if they want to make any final um, comments. 
And I'll go to you first, Catherine. Okay, I just wanted to make a comment on that question. Um, Marrickville Library is only a locally listed item, and I think in the case of Marrickville Library and the Inner West Council and the Academy of Science, we have stewards who are very um, who are very interested in um, finding sustainable solutions for the properties that they are responsible for. And I think that is really the most important thing. So it doesn't have to be nationally listed. It can be local. It doesn't even have to be heritage listed. If somebody cares about their place, then they'll look for a sustainable future. Lovely comment, thanks. Emma? Thanks. Yeah, I guess just reflecting on the uh, this place, the Shine Dome, uh, and Old Parliament House, and uh, you know how you would go about um, upgrading a place like this. I guess with Old Parliament House, you've got so many obvious, you know, layers of history, and you can see that when you're there. A place like this probably has all of those layers too, and it's a complex place as well. So it's going to take all of those, you know bespoke, um, innovative solutions to try and fit something new into a place like this. Thanks, Thanks Emma. Hans? Yes, thank you. I mean, 2020 was a year of emergency, and in Canberra it started with bushfires, and then we had a hailstorm, and the reason why you see the building fences out there and the roofs have been replaced is a consequence of extreme weather. Now, I think the academy is uniformly of the view that it's an example of climate change and we were just unlucky to be in the middle of this hailstorm. But we turned it into an opportunity. So the roof is replaced here and Ian Potter House from the insurance company. So that's another finance source and we use it as an opportunity to maintain the heritage and improve the building. So I think you can also you know, twist it around a bit and say there's a new opportunity because something went wrong, but we were insured. And finally, let me say it is terrific to see this co collaboration between very different professions and to bring it all together to one goal from science, architecture, the social, the environmental aspects. From my point of view, that's terrific. And thank you for the team to make this possible. Thanks. Thank you, Hans, and thank you to all of our other speakers. Um, a round of a virtual round of applause, a real life round of applause. <laughs> um, and now I'm just going to ask um, Professor Jason Bainbridge, who's the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Design at the University of Canberra, to say a few words in closing. Thank you, Tracy. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. And let me start by actually echoing um, Hans's point. It's great to be here for such a collaborative project and see everybody coming together in a common aim. I'm a little disappointed though to be here in person, given the fact that I would have had the opportunity to be unshrouded as part of my introduction, <laughs> which would be extremely cool. So I have missed that chance. Back in 1951, uh, 1959 rather, Roy Ground's critic, the University of Melbourne's Professor Brian Lewis, described the Shine Dome as an example of facadism, without proper attention to use and function. And today's symposium may have revealed an element of truth to that criticism. Certainly the sustainable management and conservation of the dome is not without its challenges. But equally, what a brave and beautiful experiment. I'm sure you'd all agree it is. I doubt we will be as moved to respond as aesthetically, as architecturally, or as passionately were the dome a more utilitarian machine for living, to use Le Corbusier's phrase, instead of this big, bold, simple concept, as Grounds himself described the structure. Indeed, today, the Shine Dome's classical and elegant facade represents Canberra's mid-century modern heart, so redolent of the optimism and aspirations of the post-war period in Australia and of the role of science in securing that future. And I think that's importantly something to remember as we're seeing what's happening particularly in the States, as has been mentioned previously, the importance of science 
in securing that future for all of us. I'm pleased to be back in the Shine Dome today to hear some of these fruitful discussions about the Dome's future, but most particularly to witness the amazing work being done on the Dome as artisans handcraft the new copper cladding to repair it after one of Canberra's trifecta of 2020 crises. For those keeping track, that is the massively damaging hailstorm we experienced after the bushfires, but before the global pandemic. I want to congratulate the team from the Centre for Creative and Cultural Research, Michael Jasper, Tracy Ireland, and Hakeem Abdul Rahim, on their work in organising this symposium, alongside their partners from the Academy of Science, GML Heritage, and GHD Engineering, and our special guest speakers, Dr. Carolyn Nola of the Footprint Company, Susan McDonald of the Getty Conservation Institute, and Emma Gwynn of the Museum of Australian Democracy. Please give them all a round of applause. I cannot wait to see the fruits of this project, and I'm very proud once again that it's the University of Canberra's Faculty of Arts and Design taking a leading role in the cultural and built environment of Canberra by making a contribution towards ensuring that the Shine Dome remains at the heart of Canberra well into the future and at the heart of science innovation as our community continues to grapple with the challenges of our changing climate. I now officially close and congratulate all our participants in the symposium today. Look forward to meeting some of you staying on for the reception and hope that you'll remain engaged with this project and our future events planned for 2021. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I would just like to uh, once again thank Hakim Abdul Rahim for all his work in organising today and to thank the amazing staff here at the Academy um, who've done a fantastic job. Katie Little, Rachel Doyle, Paul Richards, um, Tom Carruthers, Tim Newport and Lisa Crocker. So thank you to them. And um, now is probably the most exciting thing I've said in 2020 is that there are in real life drinks afterwards. <laughs> um, so please join us in the beautiful Jaeger room um, to uh, toast the success of all of our speakers and uh, the event today. Thanks to everyone. <laughs>